Okay. How to use TensorRT C++ API for high performance GPU inference. Let's get started. Hey everyone, I'm Cyrus. Just a quick little bit of background about me. I'm a senior developer at Trueface and also lead the SDK team. Trueface is a machine learning company specializing in face recognition and other computer vision solutions. A lot of the work that I do at Trueface does involve work, uh, working closely with machine learning inference frameworks. I'm often trying to find the balance between optimizing for latency and throughput for both CPU and GPU deployments. One of the GPU frameworks which I have worked with is TensorRT. In today's presentation, we'll be going over several things. We're gonna start by installing TensorRT for our Ubuntu machine. I'm sorry to all you Windows folks out there, you should really consider switching to Linux. Next, we will convert our Onyx model into a TensorRT engine file, which we will optimize for our GPU. We also get to specify which optimizations we wanna apply, such as using 16-bit floating points instead of the traditional 32-bit floating points. We can also specify an optimization profile in our, uh, for our preferred batch size. So that's more of what I would consider the offline steps. Then we have the actual runtime steps, which involve reading and writing data into GPU memory, running synchronous inference, and also working with models with dynamic batch sizes. The topics which we won't cover in today's lecture include multiple optimi um, using multiple optimization profiles for when you're varying the batch size, asynchronous inference, and CUDA streams, which really is a part of asynchronous inference. Um, and just a quick note before we do dive in, I did post a link on the first slide to all the code. It's ready to be compiled. You just need to drop in your own model file and you should be able to run it. So just to clarify, that's right here. So why use TensorRT? Well, considering it's developed by NVIDIA themselves, it's probably no surprise that it's the fastest inference framework for NVIDIA hardware. The framework also gives a lot of control over the amount of GPU memory which is used, which is very powerful. What is my motivation for creating this presentation? As with many of NVIDIA's developer solutions, TensorRT is not, a use, is not user friendly, especially for beginner with limited C++ experience. Basically, you're gonna to need to expect to wrangle with the code a bit to get it working. All it takes is one look at the TensorRT docs page to see what I mean. So on the right here, we have a snippet from the docs page displaying a total of only 18 lines of code. Now this 18 line snippet of code boasts an impressive five compiler errors. <laughs> Maybe I just have a weird sense of humor, but I almost find that funny. Um, though I do need to give them some credit, they do provide sample code, which does compile. However, the issue I have with the code is that it calls their own utilities, which are not part of the library itself. And these utilities add so many layers of abstraction that it's almost impossible to determine what's really going on. Therefore, I wanted to create a more beginner-friendly tutorial, tutorial, which I'm sharing today. You can go ahead and install the Debian TensorRT package, but I personally prefer downloading the tarball locally just so that I have better control over the libraries on my machine. You can do so at this link provided here. Now you may be a bit confused after extracting the package. Why is there no lib TensorRT? I know I was certainly a little confused. It turns out TensorRT consists of three main libraries, lib nv infer, lib nv onyx parser, and finally lib nv parser. So the three libraries um, outlined here. Next, we need to set up our CMake file to correctly search for the headers and also to link any dependency libraries. The strange thing with TensorRT is that they don't provide their own fine package CMake script, meaning you need to specify the dependency libraries mentioned in the previous slide yourself, which is a little annoying if you're a lazy programmer like me. Now, the good news is I've gone ahead and written one for you. And by that, I really mean that I ripped it off Stack Overflow but it's included in the GitHub project, which I linked on the first slide. 
Um, so on this slide here, there isn't, this isn't a complete CMake file. The dot, dot, dot here represents code, which has been cut out just to make it fit in the slide. But what I'm really trying to convey is that we require three dependencies, TensorRT, CUDA, and OpenCV, and we must link them in the CMake file. I should probably also mention that we're using OpenCV for loading and pre-processing images in this project. Before we get into the code, let's go over the TensorRT workflow because it's a bit confusing. I felt that this graphic, which I stole from the TensorRT docs page, wasn't complete, so I added my own annotations. Um, so we have what I call offline steps, which we'd like to perform in advance, and then online steps that will happen when our final inference application is actually running. We start by training a model in a framework of our liking, such as PyTorch, for example. Then we convert it to Onyx format. From Onyx, we're able to import it directly into TensorRT using the Onyx parser. From there, we specify which optimizations we want to apply. Then we generate what's called an engine file. This engine file, which is denoted by the plan in the graphic shown, is an optimized form of the model, which can then be used for inference. The engine file is optimized for the specific GPU on which it was generated. So you don't want to copy these engine files between different computers. It does take a few minutes to generate this engine file, which is why we do want to perform this step offline, or at least perform it only once, then save the engine file to disk. So when we're ready to actually run inference, um, we can load this engine file from disk and then go ahead and run inference. So here we have an overview of what our API looks like. Essentially, we have a struct with configuration options, which are used by the API user to specify specific optimizations when generating the engine file. Some of the notable optimizations include max workspace size, which allow the user to specify the maximum amount of GPU memory, which can be used for the optimizations and inference. I definitely advise setting this as high as your setup will allow you to. We also have opt batch sizes, which allows the user to specify which batch sizes the engine file should be optimized to run. We also need to define the maximum batch size, that's how it's here. Um, which can be encountered. It's probably worth mentioning that when we trained our model and exported to Onyx format, we defined a dynamic batch size, meaning the model is not limited to a single batch size. We also define a logger class, which we must register with TensorRT. And finally, we have our engine class itself, which has a method for building and serializing the engine, and then methods for loading the serialized engine and actually running inference. So anytime we change one of the configuration option optimizations, we need to regenerate the engine file. However, if we do not change the options, it is not necessary to regenerate the engine file. We can simply load it from disk. We can therefore devise an intelligent scheme in which we essentially stringify the configuration options themselves and use them as the name of the engine file. If an engine file with the desired options and hence the desired name exists on disk, we can simply load it and avoid regenerating the file. Whereas if no engine file exists, we will generate it, then save it to disk with the appropriate name. With such a scheme, we'll only need to generate the engine file once, uh, the first time we run the app, so long as the configuration options are not changed in subsequent calls. We could also choose to append the GPU UUID to the engine file name, ensuring that the engine file can only be used on the same GPU on which it was generated. So here we implement the logic for checking if the engine file with the desired options already exists or not. So that's done right here. As you can see, if the engine file does exist, we simply return from the function and skip the build phase entirely. Whereas if the engine file does not exist, then we go ahead and build the engine. Here we're registering our optimization profiles, which essentially specify the batch sizes 
which the engine file should be optimized for. So we specify a default optimization profile for a batch size of one, but then also allow the user to define their own batch sizes for which to optimize for. So that's done here. They're defining the batch sizes in this member variable, which was passed as a configuration option. And then we're going ahead and registering all those batch sizes. Do realize that you can still run inference with a batch size which was not specified in the optimization profile. It'll simply run faster if it was specified in the optimization profile. And as mentioned at the start of the presentation, I won't be demonstrating how to actually switch between optimization profiles at runtime, as that's a bit more tricky. So for now, we will stick to using the default optimization profile, um, which is for a batch size of one in this example. And now at this point, we've essentially generated the engine file and we can go ahead and just write it to disk. Loading the engine file from disk is pretty straightforward. We basically just read the engine file into a buffer. So that's shown here. And then we call the deserialize function. Finally, we create an execution context from this engine, which will be used for inference. Um, at this point, we can also specify which GPU we plan to use for inference for machines which um, may have more than a single GPU. So that's done right here at the top. Okay, running inference is where things start to get a little more tricky. So the input to our function here is an array of CV mats, which represents the input images on which we want to run inference. We need to start by setting the binding dimension for the model. So if you remember, when we first exported the model to Onyx, we specified a dynamic batch size. What this means is that the, that the first dimension to our model is actually not specified. We therefore need to explicitly define it at this point before we can run inference, which is being done right here. Next thing to note, we have two member variables named m input buff and m output buff. Um, and each of these contain both the CPU and GPU memory buffer. So anytime the batch size changes between calls to the inference function, we need to ensure that we resize these buffers appropriately, which is what's being done in this logical section here. So OpenCV stores decoded images as NHWC format, while TensorRT expects NCHW format. Now you're probably asking what the heck is the difference because I certainly was asking this. The difference is illustrated well by this image here. So in H NHWC format or what's used by OpenCV, the three values are stored together in RGB format. So essentially it becomes RGB, 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 and so on. Whereas with NCHW format, which is expected by TensorRT, all the red channel values are stored first then the green channel values, and then the blue channel values. So in this scheme, it's R, 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 G, 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 B, 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 and so on. So here we have the actual code implementation. Um, as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. You essentially are just rearranging the buffers and using some offsets based on the size of the input image. So that's being done right here. Okay, so now that the buffers are in the correct NCHW format expected by TensorRT, we're ready to copy the data from CPU to GPU by calling the CUDA memcopy function and specifying CUDA memcopy host to device. And just a quick note on terminology, in CUDA language, host refers to the CPU while device refers to the GPU. Um, from there, we can call the execute v2 function to run synchronous inference, meaning synchronous meaning that this call will only return once inference is complete. And once that is done, we can then call CUDA memcopy again to then copy the results from GPU memory to CPU memory. So at this point, the, the generated feature vector is contained in this host buffer, and then we can then return that to the user to the caller, pardon me. And there you have it. Hopefully that gave you a nice little overview of how to use the C++ API of TensorRT. 
Um, I definitely recommend viewing the full code that I've linked here again, because there are a few things I did skip over. And at this point, I can take any questions. As a reminder, if you did have questions,